Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have part three of Katrina Reyes. When we last left part two, security guard Spencer in Clearwater, Florida at Flag Land Base had ordered Katrina to get the hell out of Clearwater in 24 hours or she would never see her family again. We had discussed the heavy-handed way Scientology uses to control people and disconnection is certainly very powerfully used as a weapon within Scientology. We're going to pick up with Katrina where we left off. This idea that you can be ordered out of a geographical region. Yeah. I, I know there's people, plenty of Scientology have been told they can't be in L.A. Yeah. And it remo- reminds me of the movie Pulp Fiction where Marcellus Wallace uh, tells Bruce Willis's character that he's lost his L.A. privileges. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the thing about the, the church if you agree to be governed by their policies and you're still considered yourself a Scientologist, they can get away with it. Exactly. By the way, what was your freeloader debt? Originally, it was 20 yeah. some thousand. Um, but when I went and looked at the bill, they were actually charging me for PRF. So I fought them back and I was like, listen, I never finished PRF, so you can't charge me for it. And uh, I ended up basically hustling the price down to... $5,170, and they also gave me a minor discount because I received a lot of those courses while I was a minor. Um, so it was $5,170 change. But that money could have helped you start your life anew. But yeah. they're o- only too glad to take it from you because they take every penny they can every day. Yeah, I didn't have to be you know, in an 18-wheeler for a week and a half. When you got back, I mean, on the 18-wheeler, what happens next? This guy that was with, um, he knew another Scientologist who was in Orlando, and she was renting a room. So um, he ended up dropping me off in Orlando and introducing me to the Scientology woman who was Russian. And uh, I was renting a room from her for a while. And were you able to find work? Um, I was little, you know, doing little odd jobs here and there, babysitting here and things like that, but it wasn't really enough, you know, to really have a life, if you can call it. Um, the interesting thing is that parallel to all of this, when I was on my way to Clearwater after being in Russia for two years, I had a layover at JFK. And I stepped outside to have a cigarette, and I met my future husband. <laughs> <laughs> wow. At JFK Airport. And um, anyways, he, he used to come down to Orlando to Disney all the time for business, almost every single week. So we kind of stayed in touch. Um, and then, long story short, I ended up moving from Orlando to New York uh, to be with my future husband. And... Here we are, married, nine years later, <laughs> still together. Well, it had a, so it has a, a happy ending for all the hell you went through. Yes, for sure. I think it's wonderful, too, that you, you met and married a non-Scientologist. Oh, yes. Yes, for that's, sure. That's a, that's a blessing because you don't have to explain. And your husband likely doesn't want to know and doesn't care anyway. Yes. <laughs> if anything, he helped me to kind of change my my mindset to what's normal and what's not. Yeah. So, you know, some things he'll be like, Katrina, that's Scientology. That's not in the real world. Put that away. Forget about it. Don't act that way. <laughs> oh, what a good man. And, and, and it's, it's often, you know, he's compassionate. Because he understands what you went through, and he's he's helping you adapt to, to the way things are out here. Yes. And when did you in your mind say, you know what, I'm no longer a Scientologist? Was there a point where you realized that you're not a Scientologist <clears throat> anymore? I always had the problem with the way organization was ran, but I kind of still believed in Scientology. Um. Then, you know, you were never allowed to go and look at things and look on the internet and all this stuff. So, back in 2011, 2012, the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, 
I came across on YouTube uh, the two-hour interview with Jason Begay. Mm. And I watched that, and it hit me so hard because I knew Jason very well from him being on, um, on services at Flag. I have interacted with him. And I remember one of the things, um, he was, he, he was, there, there was, you know, celebrities are different. And of course there was a lot of celebrities at Flag, you know, John Travolta, Kelly, Presley, Giovanni Ribisi, uh, Giovanni Ribisi's parents. And they're all different, Kirsty Alley. But I felt like a lot of them were kind of snobby. But there were few that were always very pleasant, and it was so nice to see that real human interaction with them. And I remember Jason very well because one time I came to the front desk in St. Castle, and he was standing at the front desk, and um, he was like, oh, hey, E-Cat, because that was my nickname. Eka, and I, hey Eka, and I was like, oh hi, um, how are you? You know, and you can't fraternize, and you, you have to be very professional and things like that. And he was standing there with um, the VIP captain, so somebody who's responsible for handling all the VIPs, who was a steward member. And he goes, hey Eka, it's almost Christmas, um, and I'm like, yes, you know, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and he just went. So, uh, what do you want for Christmas? And I remember standing there looking at him and looking at the VP of the captain. And I'm like, well, I'm not allowed to fraternize with them. And he's asking me a personal question. What do I, what, what, what do I say? What do I say? And I was like, uh, I want an iPod. And he was like, oh, yeah, you want an iPod? And, and he was just so, he, he was just so nice. And he was just down to earth and he treated me like a normal human being um and like a kid like you know like he, here yeah. he sees a kid and it's like although I was a teenager but still like hey what do you want for Christmas you're a kid you know and he was just so humane I guess um anyway well, he's a great he's a great guy I I've met Jason several times and nothing but I think he's a hero for what he did making those videos. I have a great deal of admiration and respect for Jason Begay. Yeah. Because he's, he really stood up. Yes. At a, at a time when it was important to stand up. When very and, uh, few were willing to stand up. Oh, I got to tell you, what, what he did was very heroic. You know, and, and we were, I had lunch with him one day, and we were in a parking lot uh, in a restaurant in Calabasas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... You know, he, he, he said to me, Jeff, a lot of people say I'm a hero, but I, I have to be able to look my, my children in the face. Exactly. And, you know, he wanted the respect of his children. He wanted his own integrity. Exactly. And I remember when the videos came out and he said, show me a motherfucking clear. That was the shot heard around the world. And I knew it shook David Miscavige, oh, Black yeah. Land Base celebrity center to its core mm -hmm. because jason is a force of nature oh he's yeah very power he's a very powerful man but yet he's so accessible and friendly and warm yes yes it, and it, it, he reminds me of this whole you know i lived in new york with my husband for eight years and i kind of got to know this new york culture where everybody are so rough on the outside and they seem mean and aggressive and they have like this armor almost like an invisible armor yeah but at you know on the inside they're just such good people and they will help you out in any situation and i feel like i, I always had this crazy thought that like jason was like a, a an authentic new yorker he was so tough and you kind of scared of him a little bit because he just has this tough persona but then at the same time he's just such a gentle such a caring soul so so you went the way that many scientologists have you went on the internet yes yeah and then did it be, did, did you look everything did you go did you stay on the internet for a long time getting all your questions answered yes i did a lot of reading a lot of blogs um Mike Rinder blocks, Marty Bathman blocks, and 
um, the ex Scientology's kids website by Jenna Miscavige. I looked at every single Scientology related video on the internet on YouTube. So what were like the things that really, really to use the Scientology word impinged on you? The funny thing, one of the biggest things, two one of the biggest things actually. One was when there was a CNN, either CNN or BBC, I don't remember, had a Skype interview with, um, who replaced Mike Rinder? I don't know why I just went blank on his name. As the commanding officer, Office of Special Affairs, Linda Hamill replaced Mike Rinder. Mm -hmm. As the public spokesman, the international PR spokesman, yes, Tommy Davis replaced Mike Rinder. Exactly, yeah. So I see this video, of uh, an interview of Tommy Davis um, on the news, and the reporter asked him that there was uh, a lot of abuse in regards to disconnection and, and families are being ripped apart by Scientology disconnection. And Tommy Davis had this look on his face like he was so shocked. And he just went, absolutely not. There is not such a thing as disconnection in Scientology. And that got me so mad because here I am receiving harassing phone calls. You know, uh, I have, uh, they're trying to get me back on course. They're trying to get me, even though I'm, I, I'm out of the Sea Org and everything, but they're, I'm still getting phone calls, emails and everything. And they're harassing me all the time. And the only reason why I haven't told them go fuck off is because every single time they're threatening to declare me and I would lose my mother, my stepdad, and my grandmother. And here is this man who is a spokesperson for Scientology is yelling on TV that there is so absurd and there's no such thing as disconnection in Scientology. And that was my breaking point, honestly. Yeah, and, and that was true for, for many others as well, for Tommy Davis to just engage in a ball face light and i don't know if tommy davis listens to my podcast i don't care but tommy if you're listening you lied about a lot of things yeah you've never you've never owned up to it you disappeared off the radar there was a fake story about your ex-wife having cancer there was so much that's fake and false yeah. and dishonest and i hope someday tommy you come clean because mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself but you also owe it to the public and to a lot of scientologists exactly and so when you said this connection didn't exist, there was a universal uproar. <laughs> that's the best word for it, a universal uproar. And I watched him. I, you know, I can get, I can understand why Tommy was between a rock and a hard place on Xenu and OT7 and body things. Okay, yeah. I got that. Mm -hmm. Tommy had to evade that question. And I understand why any OT who talks about the contents of the upper level of materials has signed a bond to be a hundred thousand dollars per breach, right? Exactly. And I can say so I, I got that part about Tommy. I didn't hold it against him. He he couldn't do anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. But to say that disconnection doesn't exist, look, Scientology, own it, own up to it. You practice disconnection, so own up to it. And they've tried to say that disconnection is a personal choice made by parishioners. And it's volunteer. No, it's it's volunteered. And it's not. It's not. Absolutely not. Because when I got declared, and it was it was not volunteered for my mother. If the, the choice that the choice that they, they put in front of my mother in my situation was either you disconnect from your daughter, your only child, and you don't speak to her ever again in your life, or you're gonna lose where you live. You're going to lose all your friends. You're going to have to either uh, divorce your husband or he's going to stay or he's going to come with you. Then you're going to lose your mother unless her mother or my grandmother leaves with her. She's going to have no place to go. She's going to have no job. She's 47 years old. She has no credit history. She has never lived in the United States, which is so ironic. Um you know, coming from Siberia, Russia, you're thinking, oh, this is an American dream. I'm going to be in the United States. And this is the, the, the free world, especially somebody like me coming from an ex-communist country. You know, free speech, free world. 
And how ironic that me, and especially my mother still to this day, has never had a taste of this free country. And she's imprisoned by church. Well, I can't even call them a church, but she's imprisoned by this criminal organization. Exactly. It's moving from one form of tyranny to another. Yeah. To go from a, a communist regime to Scientology. And, 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 the, and the parallels have been made between Scientology and, and a, you know, a Stalinist regime, and they're very fair. Mm-hmm. They're adequate. It, 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 it is a regime. So, so when you saw Jason, that's when you began to say in your mind, I can't be a part of Scientology. I mean, when did you? I said, what? yeah, I said, I'm done with Scientology. I'm not going to do Scientology yeah. anymore. Like, that's it. I'm done. Um, so I told that to my mother. My mother came to visit me once a year uh, for two, three days. So I'm already living in New York with my husband. Um, I opened up my own business. I was very successful. Um, and my husband is a very successful professional. So uh, we bought a house. So, you know, life was doing good. And my mother came and I told her, I said, listen, I am not. I'm not going to be a Scientologist. I don't want to do any courses. So don't try to sell me basics. Don't try to sell me any books. Don't try to get me on course or anything. I'm just going to tell you right now and tell everybody else a flag that I am not going to do Scientology. And I'm not going to say anything. I just want to be done. And I'm not going to put any sticks in their wheels you know, I'm not going to do anything sure. against them. I'm not kind of like you, you leave me alone. I leave you alone. Exactly. You leave me alone. Yeah. I'll leave you alone. And um, she relied that message and they were OK with that. They were OK as long as I don't say anything. I don't go public. I don't go to the media or anything else. And in the meantime, I felt like it was so unfair for me to keep my mouth shut because they have done they really did wrong by me. And I realized that I can't hold that in anymore. I have to speak up because it's just so wrong and I'm done shoving everything down and, and holding it in. And But again, if I speak up, I lose my family. And if I don't speak up, I feel like it's huge injustice is continuing happening. Um, so I actually contacted Jason thinking... He will not remember me, but I reached out to him because that's really the only person I kind of knew. Everybody else that I knew were still Scientologists, and obviously I couldn't console with them about this type of thing. Um, f- fortunately enough, actually, Jason remembered me really well, and he, he responded back. He wrote me an email, and then we spoke on the phone on several occasions, and he, he gave me good advice, and he just pretty much said you know, if you want to continue having this relationship with your mother, you can continue just pretend and fly under the radar and do what you're doing right now. But to be, and that's, you know, to be honest, uh, what kind of relationship do you have with your mom? And that really resonated with me. And before our wedding, my mother came to uh to go to new york for our wedding she came a few days early and i sat down and i had a heart-to-heart talk with her because after that conversation with jason i realized i don't i can't i'm fighting for a relationship that i can't have with her and i told her i said listen i am okay with you being a scientologist i'm very open to other people believing in a religion i don't care i respect your views you want to be a scientologist i'm okay with that that's fine but in order for us to have a relationship, you cannot be in the Sea Org. Because I can't call you up and ask you for a marriage advice. I can't ask you, you know, we just recently bought a house and we were first, you know, house buyers, first time owners. And we don't know how the process works. I can't ask you because you have never bought a house yourself in the United States, you don't have the life experience. You don't live in the real world. There's nothing that we could talk about. And I really try to reach to her on an emotional level 
to kind of trigger her bond between a mother and a daughter to see if she will leave or finally wake up. And I, one of the most important things for me was for her not only being there for me as a mother, but I was getting married and we were planning to start a family. And I really wanted my kids to have a grandmother. And I told her, I said, listen, I'm we're going to have a start a family. You're never going to see your grandchild. You're going to come once a year for two, three days. What about Christmases and birthdays? And, you know, the first steps, the first food, that all of those are such precious moments and you're going to miss that. And it was a very, oh, it was a very emotional conversation. She started crying. I started crying. And I thought, yes, I reached her. I reached her. Um, and she said, at the end, she said, I am okay where I am for now. Mm. And at that point, I realized that I lost her. Yeah. Yeah, you try to touch your mother's heart. Yeah. And she has to make a very difficult choice, as do you. Yes. But, you, but, you know, uh, to a much lesser extent, Katrina, I was there. I had a... a, a a dear friend I admired, looked up to, a uh, client. Mm -hmm. He was a Scientologist. And I always had to apply what Scientology calls good good roads, fair weather. Yes. And it was such, it got to be such a one-sided relationship where I felt like I was walking on eggshells. Exactly. I couldn't, it, it was such an artificial and forced and strained relationship and it had to be on his terms. Exactly. And I had to watch what I said around him. He could say whatever he wanted to me. Mm -hmm. And it got to be what we would call a one-way flow. Exactly. And and, and I, I it came to a head where he, he called me. I was in Las Vegas on the road traveling. which I was calling him on his cell phone. And the church had taken money on deposit from him, you know, probably twenty four thousand dollars and delivered sets of basics to his house mm -hmm. without his permission yeah so he had what whatever I, I don't know what he had um 10 sets of basics in his garage mm -hmm. and he wanted to sell me a set and i was i was a, a a critic by that time and i hadn't told him i was out posting on xenu.net as jay swift mm-hmm and he's trying to get a couple thousand dollars from me for a basics library, which is the last damn thing I want or care to have. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I had collected all the Hubbard Library, largely from secondhand bookstores for pennies, right? Oh, yeah. And, and I couldn't talk to him. And I just flat out asked him, because he had been an OT7, he, did, he had to go through the level twice. Mm-hmm. He'd been in the church in 64. He spent, he told me once he'd spent, I mean, in the 80s, way back when, he told me I'd spent at least the cost of two Cadillacs in Scientology. <laughs> wow. One time he told me he was operating exterior from his body while I was sitting there looking at him. Mm, wow. And I knew he was in it. I mean, this is like, I can't put up with it anymore. And I said, why don't you just leave the church? Mm -hmm. I just blurted it out. And there was a pause, and he said, my whole family's in the church, my grandkids, my kids. He's going, the only way I'm leaving this church is by dying. And that was the most honest he was ever with me. Yep. And then, and then he quickly took it back. Because he realized he's going to have to now go into Sefchuk and spend money for hours for doubting. And he's going to get in trouble for even blurting out yeah. the truth of of really how he feels and yes yes exactly and that's the last i ever spoke with him and i decided i don't want to cause him trouble or misery if his choice is scientology i absolutely respect that mm -hmm. but i'm not going to have a one-sided relationship anymore i'm through with that exactly so to answer the question if being friends with you requires a one-sided thing where I, where i have to I don't have any real freedom of expression, then there's no meaningful relationship. So that was the last time I talked to him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and I like him. He's a very moral person. He's very genuine. He's very likable. He's very smart. Yes. 
and I can't talk to him again because I'm an SP. Exactly. So what happened with your mother that you? Well, I realized that I'm not going to fight for this relationship with her anymore, and yeah. I started reaching out to other ex steward members and other ex Scientologists who eventually I found out were declared. Um, and I would get I would get the phone calls from the from Scientology from the Sierra flag from the ethics officers once in a while, um, you know, once and once every two three months, about how I have these people on friends lists on Facebook and they're declared as fees and I need to delete them and not talk to them again. Otherwise, I'm gonna get declared. And I kind of kept up with all this for like two years. Until 2015, um, end of 2014, and then I said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm there. Keep going into my Facebook, keep looking at my friends list. I'm just gonna make it private so nobody could see my friends list. Period. So I did that, and I started reaching out to my Grinder and Tom Devok and this and that, and uh, I commented on Tom Devok's photo. Uh, he had a photo of a dog laying on a by a laptop. And it looked very similar to my dog. So I made a comment like, such a cute puppy or something. It's a cute dog. What kind of breed is it? Um, and then I get a phone call from the ethics officer on Saturday morning about a week later. And they're reading out a list of names as usual to me of all the friends that I have on Facebook who are SPs. And they're telling me, you need to delete these people once again. And at that point, I in, in that particular situation, I got so so upset and so angry because how did they find out my list of friends? Because it was completely private. Um, and I think that also, I, I snapped again, and that was my biggest breaking point. I just said, enough is enough. I'm tired of this harassment. And I remember just yelling on the phone and telling them, listen, you are not my fucking parent. And you can't tell me who I can and cannot be friends with. I'm not a kid. You know, I'm not in Scientology anymore. I'm not in the Sea Org. You cannot control me anymore. My husband doesn't even have a right to control me. And you are nobody. So you have no right to tell me what I can and cannot do. And, um... A little did I know my mother, was, it, this was whole thing was on speaker and my mother was listening in. She was in the room and she picked up the phone and she said, Katrina, please, I beg you, please just delete these people. Please delete these people. They're going to declare you. They're going to declare you. And I, I said, and at that point, it just like a light switch went on my head. And I just told her, I said, if they're going to de de declare me over this, then it's on you for destroying our relationship. Then mm. I will really see what's more important for you, your only child, or this organization. And it's going to be on you. And then she called me a week later and she said, oh, um, I have a printout from OSA. And there's a picture of the dog. And, and she told me about me commenting and liking Tom DeVock's photo. And she was telling me, no, they didn't They didn't break into your Facebook account. They were monitoring Tom, and they saw that you commented and you liked his photo. So um, please just delete these people. Uh, just delete these people. And I said, I I'm not going to do it just out of a principle. And she started guilt tripping me and saying things like, these people who you claim that you don't have a relationship and you don't really talk to, are they more important than your mother? And I said, this has nothing to do who is more important or not. This is just a principle that I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do what I want to do. And this is it. They're not going to control me in any way anymore. And that's it. And my mother started crying and she said, well, you do realize that they're going to declare you. And I said, and if they do, and if it happens... And you decide not to talk to me anymore. And 15, 20 years from now, you leave. You know my phone number. I'll never change it. And you can always show up at my doorstep, even if it's in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And you know I'll not turn you away. Wow. And <clears throat> I'm sorry. That was my last conversation with my mother. 
Well, you know what? That was an outstanding conversation. She knows that you love her. And even if it's 20 years, she has a place to go. And that will stay with your mother, Katrina. And it's almost, and I, and I, you know, I almost feel like a, <laughs> like an addict, you know, uh, um, and she's the drug. You know, every time I, I get involved with her, I end up being hurt, but I'm keep, um, I'm addicted and I'm keep reaching for that love. Well, you're, she's your mother. Of course. And, 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 and even though a church is in the way, you'll never stop loving her yeah. and, and her love for you. And. A couple of things that stood out to me in telling your story. This is the church that left you homeless and penniless on the streets of Moscow when you were 18. Mm -hmm. Years later, you're leaving them alone, but they're policing your Facebook page. Yeah. I mean, it never stops with Scientology. Exactly. It's not enough that they ruin you at 18 years old and you're broke and you don't even have no money to, to, to rent a couch in Moscow. Mm hmm now they're telling you who to friend and unfriend on Facebook. Exactly. And that you and that you can't have your mother unless it's on their terms. Yeah. This is why they're called a cult. That's what I keep the point I keep making in this interview. This is how a cult thinks. This is how a cult acts. This is how a cult behaves. In Scientology, you are a cult. Yeah. And 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 they your hold your family as hostage. They will hold everything dear to you as hostage. And almost a negotiation, you know, like if you're not going to follow our rules, you know what's going to happen. Well, Katrina, what that's called is psychoterrorism. Exactly. It's psychoterrorist. This is the act of a terrorist, this emotional blackmail. It's psychoterrorism. Mm -hmm. It's not fair game. Fair game should correctly be called psychoterrorism. And that's what I call it. Exactly. And the fact that they're they're trying to emotionally blackmail you into obeying, and they're using your your own mother as pawns, your family as pawns. Exactly. That shows the dark, evil heart of L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. And even though it hurts, you're not going to play their game because it's sick and twisted. Exactly. And and I think your mother. I hope your mother comes to her senses. Because to give up your, you know, you, 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 what you owe your allegiance to is your husband and your child, your family, your family. Yeah. And if your mother wants to stay in the Sea Org, she's certainly free to do so. But there's consequences to staying in the Sea Org. You don't get to see your, your daughter. Mm -hmm. You don't get to see your grandchildren. You don't get to be there for Christmas or birthdays. One of the things, um, Jeff, I, I've, I've considered to, to, to even bring this up or not, it's also a very, um, a very emotional subject um, for me. Um, but let's do it. Because it's, it's, it, it plays a big role into this whole story with my mother and our toxic relationship. Um so I got declared in 2000, January 2015, I actually got a declare order, which I find out recently that I'm one of the privileged few who got it recently. Um, and so we get married with my husband and, and we're trying to start a family. Unfortunately, we had a lot of problems um, with my pregnancies. And my mother was already disconnected from me she didn't talk to me but I talked to a lot of my relatives back in Russia and they talked to my mother so I kind of get a little bit of information as how she's doing from them once in a blue moon and um I had um I had um it, it was it was very hard for me because I thought that maybe the breaking point for her would be when I have a child and that would reach somehow into her emotionally and somehow get her to wake up from it. And when we, we actually had a couple of losses and when I um, went out and out from my relatives that they have relayed that information to her and... Um, she she told them I don't don't you ever bring up her name because it's just which is my name 
because it's just way too painful for me to even talk about her. Hmm. But the fact that she, I was kind of expecting a something, some kind of a uh, something, a postcard and uh, a letter, something, and I didn't receive anything from her. And losing a child is not is not an easy thing. No, it's devastating. It's one of the worst things that can happen. And I, I don't know, maybe call me naive. I thought that that will kind of wake her up a little bit. Um, but it didn't. And that's pretty much the time when I kind of lost a lot of the faith. I understand. I understand you give up. And you lose hope. And that's a very very bitter um, someone who, who, who left the church has done such enormous good is Leah Remini mm -hmm. and you know we're all human yes uh, it doesn't matter she's 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 a very courageous person very generous too and I've told this story before but Right after Leah publicly left the church, I, I was talking to her on the phone. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about my wife losing her son, Alexander. Mm -hmm. And the, the church didn't let Karen see her dad's son and kiss him goodbye. That's and that, devastating. It was one of the most depraved, evil things I've ever lived through. Exactly. And, I, and, and you know, Leah knew about it. And I told Leah, look, I, I, I'll i tell you, Leah, when you leave the church, it can be very raw and very brutal mm -hmm. in ways you don't understand. And, and that happened to Jason as well. J J Jason could stand up to, you know, the disconnection and everything, and, and Leah could. But for their children, you know, Jason and, and Leah, they were both sad that they're their children, all their friends, you know, all their children's friends they'd grown up with were disconnected. Yeah. So they had they had friends that were Scientologists and their children had grown up together. Now their children couldn't talk to Leah's children or, you know, Leah's daughter or Jason's children. Yeah. And, and that's how brutal it gets. And existentially, when they wouldn't let Karen see her dead son I said okay I understand what we're up against mm -hmm. and that's why people like you and I Jason Leah we're just people yeah Mark Mark and Claire Headley they had horrible things they did to Mark and Claire they tried to get child protective services to take away their children they tried to use the law to take away their children yeah and that's what that's just and that's the scare tactics because it for a lot of years, I didn't speak up because I was so afraid that they're going to go after me. And I didn't want to lose my business. I didn't. I, I finally built a very, very good life and a very wonderful family. And I was so afraid to lose that if I go against them and if I speak up against them. And it's not even speaking up against them. I'm speaking the truth. So, well, you're telling your story, yeah. You know, I'm, no, I'm just saying because Scientology a lot of times, oh, you, you're speaking against us. And it's like, no, I'm not speaking against you. I am I am stating facts as to what happened. I'm not going against you. <laughs> no, you're, you're, yeah, you are. You're telling your story. Yeah. And they can't have it that way. Exactly. And and one of the things I have, I've gotten very passionate um, ever since I left Scientology and ever since I left Sea Org was children. Children are something that we should always cherish and they are our future. And because maybe because I had such a horrible childhood myself, I worked with children and I completely and utterly adore my son. And when, you know, I had to, we went through the loss of our other son. I just remember telling uh, my relatives in Russia, I was telling them, all I want is I want a mother. I wanted somebody there 
holding my hand while I was in labor for 38 hours delivering a stillborn child. I wanted somebody there who I wanted my mother's shoulder to cry on while we were having a funeral. You know, I just I wanted my mother to be there for me. And it has nothing to do with Scientology. I just, I just wanted a human decent treatment and that in bond between a mother and a child. And I, and, I, and, and I experienced this bond now with my children, which I chose to use the word children because I do have one living and one not living. And I experienced this bond and it's very hard for me to still understand how could a mother just abandon her child completely because I can never do that to my son I could never just abandon him and leave him or even have anybody raise a hand on him it's just it's mind-boggling to me it is Uh, and and the reverse is true it's devastating that a parent could abandon their child it's equally devastating that a child could abandon their parents Mm -hmm. because there are children who stay in the Sea Org or in the church and abandon their parents. Exactly. And and, and this is where Aaron Smith Levin is so articulate in telling how this has happened to him. Mm -hmm. You know, how his, his, his wife's parents will not talk to their own daughter or their grandchildren. Exactly. For children to abandon parents or parents to abandon children, that's the Scientology way. Mm-hmm. This is a, a work that's contrary to nature. It, it is unnatural. Yeah. It only happens because it is a cult. This is the long-term devastating harm that Scientology does to families. Yeah. And the church lies about it. It's just to show, the way I look at it, it, it it's a perspective to um, for people who have never been to Scientology. It's a different perspective when you look at how manipulative and how brainwashing their tactics are that a person in the Sea Org and in Scientology could, under the influence of Scientology, completely and utterly erase their mother instinct. And I think of a mother instinct as as, as such a a basic human nature that even animals, you know, a, a, a bear... A mother would protect their cubs to death. It's, it, it's an instinct in animals. So there's a perspective that Scientology is so powerful with the way they, you know, manipulate you and, and put you down. And the way they mentally abuse you to the point, and they strip away your personality to the point that a mother loses her mother instincts. And that is very powerful. But this is what people have to understand about Scientology. They use very coercive psychomechanics. They use indoctrination. Fundamentally alter for the worse the way people perceive life, the way they value family. People come to not value family, but they value the group, the church, above family. Mm-hmm. And that's to the church's... That's an indictment of the church, and that's why, that's why it's losing members. That's why people don't want to be in the church anymore. In fact, to try to fix stuff, the church is letting pregnant Sea Org couples now route out mm-hmm. because they know they're in a losing battle. You, you, you can't ultimately defeat the power of love and family, and that's what they've been trying to do. Yeah, exactly. And, and your mother, for all we know, she may be suffering in great silence. Um... I really. Uh, are, are do you, or do you think I could be wrong? Do you think she's hardened her heart by the comments that she has, the comments that she has made to my other uh, family members? You know, the comment of "Don't even bring up my daughter's name with me because it's a, such a painful subject. I can't even hear her name." Mm. I feel like she is suffering in silence, and. And maybe that's just just me, you know, still hoping for a mother's love. Um, maybe well, she is, maybe she isn't, but um, I don't know. I feel like if she really, really loved me, she would have woken up 
eventually. But Katrina, you put it correctly when you were talking to your mother and, and you told her, look, if you choose the church over me, that's on you. Yeah. And it is on her, but it doesn't decrease the pain that you experience from the loss of your mother. Yeah. I have like a roller coaster really uh, uh, I have like a roller coaster feelings every day a battle with it you know I go through hate and anger and I really hate her and I feel like she has ruined my life so much and she has caused me so much troubles and she dragged me into Sea Org and look what happened and look what Sea Org did and she didn't stand up for me when they kicked me out and that was so painful and I get so angry and then a few days go by and I look at my son and I, th I, th I think of the way I'm with him and the thoughts of starting creeping in of she must still love me and I will always open my door for her and I can't abandon her if she's down and she has no place to go. I can't abandon her. So I, I, I go through this roller coaster emotions continuously still to this day where. And, and you will continue to. You're a very loyal daughter who loves her mother. And so that's that's going to be part of your, your the struggle you have in life. And, and, and my hope is that your mother will, will leave the church. But if she doesn't, and she may never leave the church, then that's part of the cost of having ever been involved with the Church of Scientology. Exactly. That real human cost of being involved with this destructive organization. Yeah. And uh, Katrina, I think you're very brave for, for coming on and telling your story because you haven't told it before. No, because I was always and afraid of the consequences. Well, I understand that once you go public, there are there can be consequences. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, know, I was afraid of being declared over going public and telling my story, but I got declared over liking somebody's dog photo, so I guess I have nothing yeah. to lose now. But there comes a point where you stand up and you say, you know, I'm not going to take it anymore. Exactly. The church is getting older; it's losing a lot of members; it's losing everything in the world. So. It's not going to win out against love and love and family. Mm -hmm. No matter how many how, how many mean people they have, they're not going to win. You know? Katrina, thank you so much for coming on Surviving Scientology Radio and telling your story. And truly, do hope everything works out well for you. It, it is so good to hear that you survived a horrible childhood in Scientology, being homeless on the streets of Moscow, and you you, you found love, and you were able to marry and have life after Scientology. Katrina, what would you say to people who are there on the edge where you were thinking of leaving? Tell them about what life can be outside of Scientology. Your mindset in Scientology is so closed-minded and there it's either either Scientology, you either do what Scientology says or that's, you know, that's it. There's nothing more. But there is so much more to life and the little things like having freedom to read a book or gardening, having a child and raising a child is the biggest gift that I could possibly think of. So enjoy the little things of life because it, it the life goes by so fast and it's just not worth it, you know, working forever for a church that really doesn't even care about you whatsoever. And that's the, that's really the only thing I could say. Enjoy every single little thing and leave because it's going to get so much better and you're going to feel so much more free. No, thank you for saying that. And, and I know there's people out there who, who secretly listen to the show who are in the church and those are words to take to heart. And Katrina, thank you again for coming on and look forward to talking to you again. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.